Well, it's an honor to be here tonight with such an organization. I have to hold back my tears after watching this brilliant film, so I want to start this evening by acknowledging this extraordinary group of people that provide such love and compassion. It's an interesting dialogue we're having in America today. It's about me or compassion. And the me group always says, I need more, give me more freedom, don't make me help somebody else. And then there's the compassion group, I'm sure most of you are members of, you have your compassion cards with you tonight, that says, why not? We are not only individuals, but we are humans and American humans. So I thought we'd start tonight by seeing a film that may bring those of you that are not that familiar with us and the work that we've done for 54 years, the first 30 being in Boston, and I moved the Institute down here about 23, 24 years ago. And visit with some of the people who have been through the program and what they have found in their life once they were willing and ready to take responsibility for that life. This was on national television. This was on national television about two years ago. Hello, I'm Bob Martin. Researchers continually come up with... Now in the limited time that we have, I thought we'd focus in on the dietary end. But before I do that, I want to emphasize to you that what I've learned over the decades of working with people is that how we remain healthy and vital and young, as well as have the capacity to conquer diseases, is to have the attitude that Alice had in that film. Alice and C.S., her husband, are now in their late 80s. They take cruises, they go out and dance and teach dancing three or four nights a week. They've been retired since they were in their 50s. They've been very successful in their life. When you look at that, you say, that's exceptional people. That's not exceptional people. That's what you should be. Happy, whole, and when you are that way, you have a reason to live. She had what was considered, obviously, a catastrophic disease that even after they worked and did a surgery that they told her would not affect her in any positive way. And by the way, the cancer would come back. Here it is, 15 years later, and she's completely well. So let's now move on and talk about the basics of the food. Living food is what we suggest. Most of you would cringe if I told you you had to stop eating hamburgers and hot dogs. So well. That's on Kuth food. We don't do that. We have hamburgers that aren't ground up called steak. Some of you may even think you're wise enough because you eat chicken, which, by the way, for a number of years we've known to be far more cancer causing than even red meat. Some of you that are really astute say, well, I take dairy food. A colleague of mine that Three days ago, I agreed that next year we'll probably go on an international tour, almost like a missionary tour, trying to convert people back to normality. After 50 years of research at Cornell, showed us that the number one cause of all cancers happened to be the consumption of dairy food, more so than even meat. Can you imagine that? So you completely freak when I tell you that you have to give up meat and dairy food and think, oh my God, how am I going to live on that vegetarian or vegetable diet? Well, I'm going to take you one step more. Those of us who remain vital and healthy and young live primarily, if not in total initially, when we're fighting a disease, on a 100% raw vegan diet. Now, the best students I have that acknowledge the common sense of that are the youngest students. A lot of you are certainly addicted and corrupted. That's a horrible combination. Mm -hmm. Corruption and addiction together turns out to be brain dead. You ever see that in mathematics when you were six and seven years old? A lot of us are brain dead. 
So somehow we think that, because you've read you know, odd things from odd people who are equally as addicted to you, who are purportedly experts, that when you cook something, you get more out of it. That would be like me chopping down this wooden stand and saying, gee, I'm getting more out of it than when it was whole. If I said that to you, you'd say, boy, this guy's crazy. Well, the same thing you would say to me if you had common sense about preparing or cooking the food. Every single creature on this earth, every single animal except uh, humans and the poor animals we've domesticated, eat a 100% raw food diet. They don't cook food, they don't prepare food, they certainly don't put pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, genetic modification, and grow it in sand and call it soil. They certainly don't put spray and preservatives on it afterward or irradiate it. They don't do any of those things. And by the way, the average wild creature lives seven times the length of their maturity. So if a bird takes a year to mature, they will live seven years. If a human's average life maturity is 20, we should be living 20 times seven. How many of you think you're going to live 140 years? Raise your hand. So the reality is we are way out of step. And Hippocrates for now half a century has shown how out of step we are. Because we don't only get ill people, we get the most ill people. After they've taken the rounds and they've run out of insurance money and they've been to the top specialist, as they always, the top institutions with the top specialist, and they, after they've extracted copious amounts of money from them, said to them, there's nothing more that can be done. That's usually when they call Hippocrates. All right, already, I'm going to die, I'll do something finally. And that's who we've been dealing with. Starting with our founder, by the way, who was told by the Hava doctors that she literally had six months to live stage four colon cancer in 1952. And she, thank God, remembered what grandma would have done back in Lithuania as a village doctor and healed herself and had the chutzpah to say, wait a minute, I've got to tell other people about this. If they keep listening to those boys with the stethoscopes on, they're all going to die. And that's where we found it, back there in this heart of Boston. Now the truth of the matter is, we watch what it takes for people to heal catastrophic disease. Can you imagine if you're smart enough to do this before you contract catastrophic disease, or before you want to have a baby? And the husband and wife literally clean up their body and eat nourishing food and think positive thought so that we don't have autistic children or diabetic children or, God forbid, what I see daily, children with cancer. The number one killer of children is accidents. Number two, it's a tie between leukemia and brain cancer. And when I was a youth doing this work, brain cancer in children were not synonymous. It was almost unheard of only four decades ago. And so living food is what we suggest because it's food containing high frequency. What that means in English, it has energy in it. Now somehow along the way, Western medicine with their salesmanship, and it's not the poor doctors who were conned into going to school for 12 years and trained by the pharmaceutical model, the Pasteurian effect, not the doctors, they're usually the good people in this story. But the powers that be, the people that train them, the people that teach them how to write very well on pads, prescription pads. And the remedy always is, let's not talk, let's give you a drug. And those drugs today, statistically, around the world, pharmaceutical drugs, 60% of them, one of the side effects is fatality. And one of the most common ones that people die from is the one they conned you into believing is good for cardiovascular disease called aspirin. How many of you knew that? Because it's not good, by the way. If you happen to read the medical journals, which obviously none of them do, they've been telling us it doesn't have any effect, but it does make you bleed more. And it does give you ulcers. And they've been telling us that for well over a decade now. But again, the sales of aspirin are incredibly high since that initial propaganda was placed in the mainstream mentality. And so if you are a living being, even if you think in spiritualistic or philosophical 
terminology, you know you're spiritual beings, but you're also electrical beings, your energy. Don't you think you should ask the question, where do I maintain or gain that energy from? Well, like all of the other creatures on this earth, except the poor domestic animals and we shmohutzes, basically we should get it from food. That's why we have mouths, that's why we have intestinal tracts, elimination canals. Because our bodies were built, as we've shown for 54 years, with hundreds of thousands of people, some of the sickest in the world, to eat raw food. That gives you life force, that gives you energy. And we're going to show you that over here on the side is really what you get from that raw food that you don't receive from any other form of food. Hormones, oxygen, phytonutrients, and enzymes. What is that hope? We call it the new era of hope. Hormones, oxygen, phytochemicals, and enzymes. Now, I don't want to be long-winded tonight, although that's hard for an Irish person not to do. But the reality is I'm going to go through each of these slowly. Your bodies very sophisticated messaging system, the way that cells communicate with one another is this chemistry we call hormones. Your endocrine system glands produce many of these hormones, but they also require hormones to be ingested by you. Those hormones that you should be ingesting come from plant-based food. And once you cook that food, those hormones no longer exist. So what I'm saying, to go through this again, is the way your cells communicate is through hormones. The way you're supposed to consistently have hormones until the day you die is by consuming raw, plant-based food. If you don't, which I certainly didn't for the first part of my life, and most of you haven't, our cells can't communicate. So they start to do really weird things, like become fat cells if you're lucky, or if you're sort of lucky, arthritic cells. And if you're not lucky, they could become cancer cells. Because cells that do not know what they should be doing begin to wander, begin to spin in the wrong direction, begin to collide, and then in medical offices we say, what has happened is we discovered a mass. You mean Massachusetts doctor? No, a mass. Then we have oxygen. A long time ago, before anyone in this auditorium was born, we knew that oxygen was essential for vitamins, minerals, and proteins to be digested into the human cell. The only place that we receive oxygen from naturally is from raw food. Once you cook a food, guess what leaves it? The oxygen. And that nice odor that you smell and call fragrance is actually the oxygen molecule leaving the food. So I always have to tell this joke, and I can't go by without saying it. Breathe heavily over your pot as you're cooking it, because that's the most nutrition you're going to get. <laughs> and by the way, it will look like you have a suntan since starting today, there's going to be a tax if you go to the suntan booth anyway. <laughs> so watch yourself. Oxygen also, as it increases in the body, as Otto Warburg told us in 1940, when he won the Nobel Prize, reduces the potential for every known disease, including cancer. You will have less cancer if you have more oxygen. I'll let you also have less viruses, less molds, less yeast, less fungus, and less bacteria. The next one, I'm at the very beginning of writing a three-volume academic series called Food is Medicine. Somebody approached me a year and a half ago and said, Brian, you're always spewing out these statistics and writing a little bit about them in your books. Tell me where you get that information. Bottom line is, I'm writing a lot about phytochemicals. If I did everything, if I wrote everything that I found so far, my research assistant in California and I, this would be a 30,000 page book, and by tomorrow may be a 31,000 page book. And so, I have to have had spent an awful lot of time on planes and nights and weekends reading all this research and now harvesting from thousands and thousands and thousands of international studies enough to put in three volumes in about a thousand pages. That will be out this year. 
The most important aspect of that is phytochemicals. Phytonutrients were first discovered in 1948, but sort of overlooked. The birth or rebirth of phytochemicals came in 1992 when you heard Daddy Bush. Remember Daddy Bush? He was the one that sort of thought a little bit straight occasionally. He basically said, I don't like broccoli. Remember that became a big shpahetza? Everyone was yelling at like broccoli. He, that was his response to the educated doctors at Johns Hopkins who said, after an extensive study, the most effective anti-cancer agent we have ever discovered in oncological history, the study of cancer, is from broccoli sprouts. Now, can you imagine that? This is Johns Hopkins, who's funded by the pharmaceutical industry, who said the most important anti-cancer medicine we've ever found is from a broccoli sprout. And at that point, Everyone went completely nuts in the biological research community, and now there has been thousands of studies done globally, and they have found that every single raw living plant, every single raw living plant that's edible, has a different type of chemistry in it that prevents and eliminates different types of diseases. And guess what? The added side effect? Aging. And it is clear to us at Hippocrates, after, thank God, Johns Hopkins and then a legacy of others began this research, why our program has been so dynamically effective in every single form of disease and anti-aging. The last one is enzymes. When we talk about the body being electric and need life force, this is ultimately where we get the life force from in the food. If you know anything about enzymes, when they improperly and incorrectly and incompletely teach us about enzymes in university, they tell us that they're proteins. Well, that's only a very small part of the story. That's like taking the shell off an almond and eating it and forgetting to eat the almond. Bottom line is, an enzyme, although the exterior shell is a protein, what it does is carry electric to your electric body. And so what we see is that when we carry more electric, bioelectric as we call it, biological electric, to the human cell, the human cell increases its electromagnetic frequency so that in and around it, it has a major, major, major shield. Let's go slow because now I'm going to tell you about the mechanism of aging and disease occurs. And that major big electric shield prevents free radicals from killing healthy cells, which is ultimately the cause of all aging and disease. Every single disease is free radical. When you do something bad, smoke cigarettes, eat meat, lay around, get lazy, don't exercise, be negative, all the many, many things that we do to get ourselves sick, they do not directly, cigarettes do not directly cause lung cancer. They cause what? Free radicals. But if we have this electricity in and around all our healthy cells to shield it from this electric that's going to come and kill it, called a free radical, guess what? We don't get sick and we don't age. So bottom line is, this is a different kind of hope than our president talked about. That's an important hope. But this hope is physiologically important to you. The hope of receiving hormones, oxygen, phytochemicals, and enzymes. And it's not something that's hard to aspire to and achieve. It is hard to get over your addictions and your perpetual lifestyle. I know. It is hard to make changes. And even though most, if not all of you, get exactly what I said, because it's laid out very precisely and clearly, and I stand with major research behind this, you will go out of here and not employ this. Because ultimately the very first thing I said to you tonight is how all of us get well is first and foremost psychologically. And until you and I and everyone else individually are willing and ready to honor and respect our lives and to live with integrity enough to show ourselves that we honor and respect our lives, we are walking sickness magnets. 
And not only are we going to be emotionally and physiologically sick, but we also are going to contribute to the global human or humanity of sickness we have out there today. The massive hysteria. The next magazine that we're putting together, a couple of my colleagues are right here in the audience tonight, is titled Truth. If you're on our mailing list, which if you haven't signed, it's out there in the, in the lobby, that will come out. And I'm going to tell you, in my perception, what truth really is. And sadly, most of our minds are like conveyor belts and with very narrow, small perceptions. And these conveyor belts come along and all we take from that conveyor belt is what our little, tiny, narrow perceptions are capable of understanding. And no wonder humanity finds itself at the brinks of disaster today, where we live on a planet and treat it like a cesspool. It's almost as if we are totally detached from reality at this stage. And we still have debates over whether or not we're destroying the planet. What, are we brain dead? I walked on these beaches here in the 1960s. I remember here in parts of Palm Beach County literally walking out straight east an eighth of a mile or more. And now the rare time I'm at home on weekends and not out lecturing somewhere, I'm hugging the breaker walls to get out of this. But you changing yourself, honoring yourself, respecting yourself, and thanking God every day for what you have. And once you are ready to do that, you will affect those in your family, your community, and eventually the ripple effect, your humanity. And if we don't have the wherewithal to do that, I petition you to spend your full effort on getting to that place of self-respect. Because the lack of self-respect is what you see going on out there in this very sick society that we have today. It is more accepted today to lie and to do the shortcut than it is to be truthful and go the right way. And we honor things that are not honorable, and we don't honor what is honorable. It's just amazing to me. You have people convincing you of things that are completely fantasy that you'd rather believe than think on your own. As I spoke earlier, we live longer than we've ever lived. <laughs> silly. Really silly. So it's time, people. It's time that we awaken as people. It's time we come back to the place of our birthright, and that place is to have happiness and health and prosperity. Not greed, not control, but prosperity. And it's time that we have at least enough self-respect that we want our children and their children, and hopefully their children, to live in a different world than we live in. It's not good enough to send Greenpeace a check occasionally, or when you're looking the other way, give a dollar or two to the poor woman or man that's living on the streets of America, because our system without compassion doesn't help them anymore. But to turn our heads, I just heard, as I walked out the door today, coming here to lecture, that now we have almost double the homeless people in New York City, which we Americans like to say is the greatest city in the world. Washington, D.C., you've been there lately? The capital of the United States. You want to see homeless and poor people, other than maybe Mississippi and Alabama, I can't find a place with poorer and more homeless and more distraught human beings. And we basically have to awaken. And don't think that this is going to be something that's done from up down. It's got to be you out. And every great movement in the history of humanity has been one woman or one man standing with truth and integrity and being unwavering in their commitment to self-respect and honor. There is never, ever a time where that's not the way that things come back to normal again. And so I challenge you right here in South Florida to do this. 
We have cushy lives compared to most people, you know that. And the truth of the matter is, maybe it's time to have lives of significance, not just lives of comfort. So let's take a deep breath now. I got a little intense there for a minute. That's just my nature. <laughs> Another deep breath and we'll answer questions for the remaining time that we have together. And we'll try to do this as I always attempt in an orderly way. We'll go to the back of the theater and then work our way forward. And any of you that have questions, remind me to repeat it because I always have the answer coming out of my mouth before I give the question. This all started with me in 1980 when I became the director of Hippocrates. <clears throat> Literally at that point I thought that if you changed the diet that people would all get well and be perfectly fine. And then I started to notice when I got myself into the position of directorship that my idea wasn't always turning out to be so. And so reluctantly, but certainly with enough background, I brought on board our very first psychotherapist, who was an extraordinary woman. She was actually married to one of the Cabots, who was one of the poor Cabots, the Harvard professor. And she and he in the 1940s literally created the biological science of aging called gerontology. You realize they were the first human beings that ever looked at it scientifically and said, here's what aging is, let's look at it. And so she was an exceptional human being, a sweet little woman from in Boston, what we call the hill. How many of you know Boston? When you're up on the hill, that was the place to be. And the first day I interviewed her, she was petite, must have weighed 85 pounds, wore a polka dot blue, dark navy blue dress, and had white silk gloves on. And she walked in and she put her hand out like this to me, and I had to have her step up the stairs. And I said, this isn't going to work. And I watched this little dynamic woman radically and immediately <coughs> change people's lives. And from that point forward, my foremost objective at Hippocrates is always to bring a person that I would consider gifted in psychotherapy. I cannot even count the number of times. It's, it's literally thousands of times I've seen that that pinnacle time that the psychotherapist spends with an individual being the turning point in their survival. As a matter of fact, if it's not done with the psychotherapist, you individually must do that for a turning point in your survival. It's that simple. Everything hinges upon that conveyor belt and your level of openness. Is your perception large and accepting or small and incapable? And if you have a small and incapable potential, that's how your possibility to be healthy, young, vital, and recover is. So it's, it's quite simple. It's like addition and subtraction. So I don't think any serious health center uh, can be a serious health center without psychotherapy <laughs> being a part. And in that time, the world began to heal, and we created something that you know of as the United Nations which was originally a pretty good group of people that said, we're going to come together and say, well, no more war, no more of this insanity, Holocaust, and all these things that we do. And he came out and went to the World <coughs> Health Organization, a wing of the United Nations, and said, you know, I'm a reformed guy now. I'm no longer a Nazi that wants to kill people, because he had seven years to scheme this. He said, what we want to do is make sure that all people in the world get food and medicine. And what he was really saying is that in seven years, I figured out, our little German army couldn't take over the world. But let me tell you, you want to take over the world? Control food and medicine. Anyone doubt that, by the way? <laughs> so they came up with what is today called COACs. <laughs> and they have a plan that really went into gear when we created the 177 nations called the what? World Trade Organization. They had to wait until we had unification on a global level. And so that you know this, the World Trade Organization has laws that supersede 
laws, and sovereignties of, of countries. Do you know that? So if you're a member, which we are here, and every country with any money is a member, the only ones that are not members are people who don't have enough money, they basically have laws that say that this is more important than American laws. And one of the things that they did is they did a test or a pilot program three years ago. If you were a little bit awake, I know most people uh, believe the media here, which is nothing but a propaganda machine. But if you were a little awake, this was sort of on the back page of the New York Times, <laughs> hidden below you know, the car sales or something. They talked about how somehow the grains in the world went up three times in price overnight. Somehow, you know, we're paying billions of dollars to farmers globally not to grow food. We in the United States every single day throw away three million dollars worth of surplus grain. And I'll repeat this, I know it's a little fast. Every day we throw away, take and dump into the ground three million dollars of grain because we have so much and we want to keep the price. But somehow it went overnight up three times and that it killed hundreds of thousands of people because they did what? The star for it. And the people who have enough money, they have little jobs or God knows what. Now the average person in many third world countries is paying 60%, 60% of what they make to purchase grains to feed their family. So this is the beginning of Codex. They also had a plan that, thank God, so far has failed, and I'll go further <laughs> to tell you how we're making that fail, hopefully, is by December 31st last year, 2009, they would fully engage the Codex laws in this country. Now, they have been slowly but surely doing it. In Canada, where I spent the last week, they have gone probably 70, 5% further than they have here. And I was sort of lost in what to do about this. I belonged to groups, but they never seemed efficient. They seemed much too counterculture, much too radical, and much more uh, embellishment than fact. And finally, on a website last year, I put out a request globally for somebody to join us as a representative for the Codex, and I was pleasantly surprised to receive 150 applicants, and I spent 28 hours reviewing them, and have one of my colleagues who was a man who helped to put together the very successful company called Sun Systems, who now counsels corporations on how to function, interview some of these people, and I selected the right one, thank God. Not because I was smart, just thank God. She was a lobbyist in Washington. And she was somebody who, back in 1997, put together the safety law for us to have the right to take nutritional supplements called the Duche Act. And I got on after David from Boston interviewed her, and I interviewed her, and David said, ask her who helps her. And she said, Clinton Miller. Now, Clinton Miller was my cohort and colleague back in 1981 when they tried to eradicate everything back then with what was called the Quackery Report. They did a big report and all of us were on it except pharmaceutical and what? Medicine. So they tried to wipe us out there. And Clinton Miller pretty much single-handedly was a health freedom advocate. Stop that from happening. Of course, we sent in hundreds of thousands of letters and called night and day to the Congress and Senate, but he single-handedly did it. This is who she's working with. So it was almost like a spiritual intervention. So we have hired them. We don't have the money to hire them. We have hired them. So far, we have stopped the Codex ruling back last November to be in the law of supplementation. About February 3rd, if you've been keeping up with it, I'll tell you how all of you can keep up with this and potentially help us do this. McCain actually proposed another bill that would eradicate the ability we had as Americans to buy any supplements at all. One week ago, through Orrin Hatch, Beth Clay literally went in and convinced Orrin Hatch to tell him to get 
get back and not to do it. He did. So we stopped that successfully at this point. If you want to help, our public wing is actually called, if you get on the internet, popcampaign.org. Pop meaning protect organic power. On my desk today, and tonight I'll be reading it after I leave here, we are now trying to protect organic ruling and take out where Kodaks, they actually in words say, Kodaks will supersede our organic laws in America. We're trying to take this out. Hopefully we succeed as we have in the last few attempts with this. But if you want to help us, support us, and keep up to speed on what we're doing, it is called Pop Protect Organic Power Campaign.org. So it's my objective, besides directing Hippocrates and traveling all over the world, to make sure that America keeps its freedom. I think that bones and joints can redevelop, but the most important single element is resistant exercise. It's not putting more blood cells there. It is doing what the human body has always done, and that's work under resistance. We are the first five or so generations that we're not farming, that we're not lifting weight 12 hours a day. And so how I say this with such authority over the last four decades, I've never seen a woman get well eating exactly like I tell her. But if she does the second thing I tell every one of them to lift weight, every one of them get well. Some of the staff that are here remember Phyllis last year, 94 years old, within a matter of six weeks, increased her bone density 21%. Now, that was the best example I've ever seen in all the years I've done the work. You don't lift weight, you're going to have a problem. Yes, you need blood there, but that's circulatory, and that comes from eating right, moving, etc. People do not drink enough. And I'm sort of a pragmatic character, and I used to get really angry at the guests because we told them the statistics. If you're not an athlete or living in Arizona in the summertime, <laughs> for every pound, you require a half an ounce of healthy fluid for every pound you have. So if you weigh 200 pounds, how many ounces is that? 100 ounces of pure water or juices made out of organic food, etc. So you require that. If you live in Arizona, you may need double that in the middle of, of August when there's zero humidity and maybe you're walking outside. But that's average. But then I realized after one night as my wife and I were laying in bed, as we do every night, and read scientific journals, there was a little tiny journal uh, article from, I forget, it was Europe, wasn't it? Where they said, now we discovered from MRIs that 40% of the population lack the ability to know they're thirsty. So I felt really bad for being angry at all those people, and I realized that 40% of the people, how many of you sit here like that? And if somebody doesn't keep telling you you have to drink, you don't drink, raise your hand. See, it's always about 40% of the population. It's like amazing. So that's the big problem right there. So 60% of us are dehydrated. 40% of them, well, I'm not sure it's that exact 40%, but that 40% of us don't even have the ability to know we're thirsty. So this has to be pragmatic and calculated. You have to sort of make a chart if you're one of those people who've raised your hand and say, okay, as in our house, in the morning before we leave the house, we drink a quart and a half of fluid. Every day, seven days a week, if I'm here, if I'm in Europe, no matter where I am in the world, every day before I get up and walk out of the house, it's a quart and a half of fluid. And then, you know, you should have a, a mid-morning drink, before lunch drink, mid-afternoon drink, before dinner drink, and try, especially as we mature, to stop the drinking three hours or so before you go to bed. Now the exception is, if it's the middle of August and you've just taken a walk out here in Florida, disregard what I just said to you, because you may go to bed dehydrated. But the truth of the matter is that's general rule. Also, certain kinds of fluids hydrate the body better than other fluids. We're blessed here to get coconut water. Now don't eat a lot of the meat and certainly don't take the coconut oil. Not a good idea. But if you can drink coconut water, incredibly good. I can't think of anything better. Some of the alkalizing units, they're not filters. So any of you that know about alkalizers, don't think that they filter things. They don't. They have a charcoal filter that's not much better than a Brita filter, even the ones they charge you ungodly sums for. And so you need a real filter system. And then after that, if you also have the thousands of dollars it takes to purchase an alkalizer, yes, it's a good thing. It organizes the water in such a way that it hydrates the cells very well. Raw juices with their, what, enzymes, 
phytochemicals, all the things we spoke about tonight, literally hydrate the body better than most water does. And the problem with water, if you go back to Schulenberg, the beginning of the 20th century, this guy was a genius, he wasn't a scientist. He used to walk out of nature, he was a naturalist, and he noticed that water always moved in exotically ge geometric ways. He always, waterfalls, and when you see water come down over streams and brooks, they would spin, and these little vortexes would occur. And he started to acknowledge this a hundred and some years ago. And of course, all the arrogant intellectuals said, oh, what are you talking about? He was right. Now we're starting to realize with modern quantum science and biology that the movement and structure of water creates two hydrogen to one what? Oxygen. Another thing when I was studying, I learned as I study things to write and put in my books, which is great. That's probably why I like writing so much. A few years ago, a Swiss company approached me and asked me to write a book on longevity. I think we have it here tonight. And it's not about nutrition as much as it's about all the aspects of longevity. But one of the things I was shocked to find out about that and, and put it in my book, Vitality, that will be out later this year, is that two-thirds of our oxygen comes from water consumption. So let's go back to where this question started. Sixty percent of us dehydrated, and two-thirds of the oxygen that humans are supposed to acquire should come from water. Whoa! So why we're walking around half brain dead, sick, lethargic, is we don't even have enough oxygen because we're not drinking enough water. Number one thing you need to put in the green juice is greens. <laughs> Parsley, watercress, you know, collard greens, kale, celery, celery, celery cucumber. cucumber, all of these things that you do. Now, remember, when I'm home and I have enough sprouts, I don't put inferior vegetables in the green drink. Vegetables are inferior, dramatically inferior compared to a sprout. A sprout is 10, 20, 30 times more nutritious and filled with nutrition enzymes and all the things we spoke about versus. But a Hippocrates because we realize people were eating pork chops before they came quite often and carrot cake under the auspices it was organic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we know, we know we need to transition them not into the you know, strong stuff, <laughs> we give them the softer stuff like that. So that's it.